Okay, we are reading Corey Ten Boom, Keeper of the Angel's Den by Janet and Jeff Bangi. We are on chapter six, titled The Window Washer. What possible good could it do taking her away? Willem asked Corey. She couldn't work and it would take effort and money to transport her on one of their trains. He was referring to the 91-year-old blind Jewish woman the Nazis had carried away from his rest home. Corey stared into his tired eyes. She had no answer. So many questions in Holland were now unanswerable. Most of the time it was too painful to even ask the questions. By 1943, there were few Jews left in the country and they were all in hiding. Those who were found were herded onto trains and shipped off to concentration camps, never to be heard from again. By summer 1943, the Bay had six permanent guests Four of them, Jewish, and a steady flow of others, mainly Dutchmen, trying to avoid being sent to the labor camps. Sometimes when the situation was not too tense, Hans, one of the guests, would spend hours retyping papers and letters that told other Dutch people about the awful things happening in their country and in Germany, and laying out how they could play a part in helping stop them. At other times, such as when Noli was arrested for hiding a Jewish girl in her home, it was simply too dangerous to do much but lay low and wait. During those times, the men would take two-hour shifts peering out through the blackout curtains, hoping that if the Gestapo did raid their hiding place, they would be able to sound an alarm early enough and give themselves an extra 30 seconds to make a run for the Angel's Den, the name they had given the secret room. The days seemed to drag on and on. Of course, the guests couldn't leave the Bayer, except in an emergency. Sometimes, though, they were able to sit on the roof in small groups. A thin balcony, about seven feet wide and 20 feet long, ran down the middle of the roof of the front house. The tin booms had put a washing line on the balcony, and many of the family chores, such as peeling potatoes and mending clothes, were done there during the day. Since the balcony was not visible from the street, the guests were able to relax a bit and enjoy the sunlight and envy the birds that flew freely around Harlem. The nights were more interesting than the days. Electricity was now being shut off at dusk to conserve energy for the German war effort. So many homes in Harlem created ways to make their own lights. At the Bayer, Corey's bicycle was wheeled into the dining room after dinner and set on a stand. One after another, people took turns pedaling with all their might. Of course, the bicycle didn't go anywhere, but the spinning back wheel worked the dynamo, which in turn lit the lamp on the front of the bike. As the light shone, one person would pull his or her chair close to it and perform the agreed upon entertainment. Lean Dirt, who had installed the alarm in the house, gave lectures on Dutch literature and organized play readings. Mary, who had been a travel agent for an Italian company in Amsterdam, gave travel talks on famous places in Italy and tried to teach everyone Italian. Even Caspar Ten Boom, who at 84 had little use for Italian, showed up for her lessons with a small black notebook and a freshly sharpened pencil. Hans taught astronomy, and then the bike would be wheeled over to the piano where Mary would play her music. Often, some of the other guests would join in with a violin or oboe. Many books were read aloud during this time. There were books of plays, poems, history, mystery, anything to pass the time and keep people's minds off the terrible things going on outside their little refuge. But it was not easy to forget. Every person who entered the Bayer could be a spy, and even a person loyal to the cause might be caught and tortured by the Gestapo for information. No one knew for sure how anyone would respond to the Gestapo's tactics. They all knew, though, that under torture, any contact could give them all up. So imaginations often ran wild, wondering whether things that seemed normal and innocent were really that way or whether they were a cover for something much more sinister. One lunchtime in June of 1943, the nine people in the house, Corey, Betsy, their father, plus the six guests, were seated around the dining room table. Suddenly, they heard a scraping noise outside and everyone stopped eating. Corey looked towards the window and froze. There was a man staring in at them through the flimsy lace curtains. Corey wondered how that could be. He would have to be eight feet tall to see in that window. And so he was with the help of a ladder. 
They all watched as he wet the window with a cloth and began rubbing it energetically. We didn't order a window washer, Corey hissed under her breath. Everyone sat staring until Yusi broke the silence and whispered urgently, Keep talking. We're having fun. We are all at Mr. Ten, Beam, Ten Boom's birthday party, and in just a minute, we will sing to him. Corey lifted the half-eaten slice of bread to her lips. Her mouth felt far too dry to swallow anything, but she knew Yusi was right. They must act normal. Mary passed the salt, and Hans told a joke. They all laughed loudly at it. Then Yusi turned to Casper Ten Boom and burst into the Dutch birthday song, Lang zal heij leven, long shall he live. Everyone applauded enthusiastically at the end of the song, and Corey felt it was then safe to get up from the table and talk to the window washer. Good day, she said as she popped her head out the door. I didn't know we had arranged to have our windows washed today. With the window washer looked back at her with surprise. Isn't this the Baker house, he asked. No, laughed Corey as best she could. I think you have the wrong address. Some friends and I are in the middle of a celebrating my father's 85th birthday, so it's not a day for window washing. Won't you join us? She asked, forcing a smile. The window washer shook his head. No, I'd best be on my way to the baker's. My apologies for disturbing you. He tipped his hat, pulled the ladder from the wall, and walked off down the street. Corey locked the door behind her and went back to the dining room. How things had changed. Before the occupation, a window washer who had made a mistake with the address would be just that, a window washer who had made a mistake. Now he could be so much more. He could be an NSB spy or someone from the next street who wanted to earn extra rations by turning in a group of divers and their hosts. Instead, the dining room, the party atmosphere had divided... Inside the dining room, the party atmosphere had evaporated as quickly as it had come. Everyone sat silently with his or her own thoughts and worries. And after the incident, Corey felt safe in the dining room only when the blackout curtains were drawn. She would have liked to keep the, them drawn all day, but that would have certainly made the neighbors suspicious. Christmas of 1943 approached, and so did Hanukkah. Everyone in, joined in the celebration with Yusi. Each night, he lit another candle on the menorah, read from the Torah, and chanted the ancient prayers. Inside the baye, everyone felt safe, but leaving the house was another matter. None of the guests liked the idea of going outside. Every few yards on the street, there was some official who might ask them for their identity papers. At the same time, they did not like being inside the baye all the time either. No matter how they entertained themselves, it got incredibly boring. Sitting inside month after month, the youngest guest was 17-year-old Jop. He had been a watchmaking apprentice to Corey and her father. After he was nearly arrested and escorted to a labor camp, his parents had asked if he could stay at the Baye. At first, he felt safe working downstairs in the workshop, but as time passed, he moved his work area onto a large board in the parlor. One afternoon in January of 1944, Jop and Corey stood talking in the back of the clock shop when Rolf and Liet. A local policeman stepped quietly inside. Corey gave him a friendly greeting. She knew he helped the underground whenever he could. Like so many Dutchmen, he had made the painful decision to stay at his job, now under German control, and try to warn people about, if not prevent, some of the worst things the Nazis tried to do. And that was why he was in the clock shop. He had read in a police report that another underground refuge, like the Baye, was going to be raided that night. He hoped Corey knew someone who could get a message to them. Corey glanced at the large Frisian clock that stood in the hallway that led from the clock shop to the dining room. It was nearly five o'clock. There was no time to send for someone in the underground, give him instructions about the raid, and have him safely deliver the warning before 6 p.m., the new curfew time. I'm sorry, Corey told Rolf, but I can't think of anyone at this short notice to deliver the warning. It's getting tougher every time to... Her voice was interrupted. Corey, let me go. I know that area well, and I'll be fast, said Jop. Corey looked at the eager 17-year-old she had become so fond of. Jop's parents were grateful that he was safe at the Baye. How could she allow him to go on such a dangerous mission? On the other hand, how could she not let him go? 
He was the best hope for warning an entire family like the one at the Baye, and they were about to be raided. How would she feel if someone could have warned them of an impending raid but didn't? You'll have to be very careful, she said quickly, hoping she wouldn't regret the decision, and we'll have to get you dressed. Yop smiled. He had seen enough comings and goings at the Baye to know that the young men seldom went out onto the street without a dress, hat, and muff on. These days, it was much safer to be a young woman than a young man in Holland, unless, of course, you were stopped and asked to produce identifications. Then the young woman better know how to run long and fast. Ten minutes later, dressed and ready, Yop kissed Cory goodbye and slipped out the side door. Cory waited patiently for him to return. Finally, the bells of St. Bavo Church chimed six o'clock, and Cory knew she would not be hearing from Yop until morning. Once it was curfew time, he would not risk returning to the Baye. He would find himself somewhere to hide for the night. The next morning, it was not Yop at the door, but Rolf the policeman. Rolf had bad news. When Yop had knocked on the door of the house, the supposed owner answered. Not being a regular member of the underground, Yop didn't know that the man wasn't the real owner. He gave him the warning, and then the door swung open wider to reveal two Gestapo agents with their guns drawn. Corey felt herself go pale. I should never have let him go. I should never have let him put himself in danger, she whispered. Rolf put his hands on hers. We all do what we think is best at the time. Corey nodded. She knew he was right. No one was any more or less danger than anyone else in Holland these days. I hate to say this, Rolf went on, but no 17-year-old boy can keep secrets from the Gestapo. They have terrible methods. His voice trailed off. He didn't need to say any more. Corey knew exactly what he meant. It might take an hour or a day or a week, but in the end, Jörg would tell them something about what was going on at the Baye. Later that night, Corey told her father and Betsy about Jörg's arrest. The question, the same question the Ten Booms had asked themselves at, every, at other dangerous moments was asked again. Should they go on with the underground activities and put themselves and their guests at risk? And the answer, as it had been every other time they'd, question, they'd asked the question, was yes. They could do nothing else. They would do all they could to keep their guests safe, and they would trust God to do the rest. When Corey finally got to bed that night, she lay awake for a long time, looking at the old bookshelf with the angel's den tucked behind it. God, she prayed, whatever happens, surround that hiding place with your angels and keep any who hide there safe in your care.